What's up, everybody? Excuse me. What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we're back with another installment of the System Crafters live stream series. Uh, I'd like to say hello to everybody who's here already today. Uh, Drishal, uh, Luis, uh, Reynas, Balaji. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, I'll give people some time to start filtering in here while I'm trying to get my computer uh, set up correctly. Uh, hey, Simon. Now let me close my Discord here, because there's a lot of people chatting in the Discord, which is great, but it's also distracting to see it over inside of my eye. Hi, Toke. Uh, Jerry. John. I think that's what you told me to call you, John. Uh, it's so nice that it's Friday. Hey, Andreas. Felipe. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to having some time this weekend to... Uh, uh, to do a very fun project that I like to do every year, which is my taxes. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not looking forward to that at all. It's going to be a nightmare. So, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm trying to enjoy my Friday, enjoy the stream, you know, enjoy the day enough that uh, when tomorrow comes, I at least know that something good happened on Friday. Whenever I start crying when I do my taxes, so it's going to be great. All right, let me see if I can get the uh, the screen pulled up here. So. Get the chat pulled up. Everything is good. Let's get going. So today, the uh, the first topic of conversation, which many of you have already you know shouted out the the meaning of the acronym to me in various uh, mediums so far, but um, the topic is what is GNU, and the reason why we're talking about this is because. Um, a lot of the stuff that we use on this uh, channel, the programs we use on this channel, you know, GNU Emacs, GNU Geeks, etc are part of the GNU project. And maybe you've seen some information about GNU online before, or maybe you haven't. I, I kind of want to give some context to the people who don't really know much about what GNU is and why it was started, um, and also what it really means. You know, it's sort of like the philosophical underpinnings of GNU and how that impacts um, basically how we use our computers. Uh, hi to everyone else who joined. Antonio, Sanad, uh, Eric, Garjola, Mark. So um, basically, uh, as a lot of people have already correctly answered, uh, GNU is not Unix. Uh, but what does this really mean? So th th there's sort of a thing in the programmer community, or at least it used to be a thing maybe back in the 90s, early 2000s, where you would have these recursive acronyms. So GNU is not Unix is basically G-N-U, GNU is not Unix. But um, the meaning here is that uh, GNU is, is a project that... It, aims to provide a Unix compatible um, operating system uh, through a variety of tools that are created for that purpose. And it basically it's a, a free software replacement for the core tools of, of Geeks. Or sorry, of, of Unix. I keep saying Geeks. Anytime I see anything with uh, IX at the end, it just automatically reminds me of Geeks. So the reason why GNU was created it was that uh, Richard Stallman, who I'm sure a lot of you have heard of if you're not familiar with him already, um, he started in around 1983, 1984 as a response to some uh, stringent agreements around the software on the systems that he was using at the time. So uh, he was a member of the MIT uh, AI lab, and there was a very um, f flourishing hacker culture in the in the AI lab at the time. Or really what it means is there, you know, people were learning about computers and programming, and they were writing a lot of programs, doing a lot of really interesting things. And one of the core principles of that community was that they would share the programs they were writing with each other, uh, either to uh, maybe um, uh, just like, you know, somebody made a cool program, they wanted the other people to try it out, or maybe they wanted to learn from the program, or maybe they wanted to add their own improvements to it. So this is sort of a, a cultural thing in the AI lab at the time, and people really enjoyed it. It sort of, you know, led to a lot of innovations and tooling and stuff that they were, they were creating there. However, 
at some point, um, their these computer systems they were using at the time, I think it was like the, the digital PDP-10 or something, uh, was starting to reach its limits, and they had to upgrade to newer machines that were had access to better hardware for a lot of things. And with these newer machines came newer software that had restrictions on how it could be used and shared, basically. So uh, Richard Stallman basically got a little bit annoyed by this. The fact that now the culture that had been get, being created at the AI lab was no longer able to do this software sharing they were doing before because they all had to sign basically non-disclosure agreements to use the software on the machine because the source code was there on the machine. Uh, so he's like, well, I, I can't really stand for this. This really doesn't make any sense to me. Like the whole fundamentals of how I use a computer now are threatened by these agreements that have to be signed just to use this stuff on the computer. So basically, uh, he decided that he wanted to make his own uh, operating system, his own version of Unix, because I believe Unix was the operating system being used on the system that they had moved to at the time. And uh, it, it, he basically start, started off on this project for GNU, GNU is not Unix, basically making a project that is a Unix compatible operating system uh, to provide all the same tools so that you can do the same kind of work, but you don't, you're not encumbered by basically these licensing agreements or these restrictions made by companies who are trying to basically make money off the software, which honestly, I mean, it's, it's fine for a company to want to make money off software. Um, and it's also fine for them to say, di to dictate to you how you use it. However, it's, it's not necessarily your right or sorry, it's not your responsibility to actually, you know, use it just because they, they do it that way. If you want to use something different, then either you have to choose something else or you have to make something new yourself. And this is what Richard decided to do. He basically decided that because he didn't want to live in a an environment where, you know, someone had total control and could tell him how to use his computer, he decided to make his own software so he could get away from that. So um, he basically started to send out information to people saying that he was going to start this project. Uh, one of the things that he sent out was the GNU Manifesto, which I think is a very interesting read because it's sort of a a historical artifact of the times. He's explaining his rationale for why he started the GNU project and basically what the plans were for it. Um, we're not really going to start look, reading this whole document right now, but I definitely suggest checking it out. I'll have the the, um, the notes here in the show notes or in the description below after the stream is over with. Um, but basically, I'll pull it up just so we can see it. Um, the people who are asking what the font is, this is uh, Iosevka. Um, Iosevka Ale. Why is it putting it here? That's really strange that I put it on the screen. Let me see if I can drop that to Workspace 2. Here we go. Chat's back. Boom. All right. So basically, uh, he's just laying out the points for what GNU is, why he's doing it, and what he thinks the principles are uh, that software developers should abide by whenever they are uh, creating software for people. And this is his own personal uh, ideas. However, these ideas um, resonated with a lot of people, and a lot of people actually started contributing to the GNU project, basically helping to uh, develop replacements for the programs that you would normally see in a Unix system, uh, and also writing new programs that were useful in their own way. Um, so basically, uh, you know, GNU Emacs was a result of this whole effort. Actually, I think GNU Emacs was being developed before the GNU project, maybe, um, uh, and then it became a part of the GNU project, but uh, a lot of programs like this that are sort of new and unique were being developed as part of the GNU project. Now, to, to be more accurate about the history of Emacs, actually, Richard Stallman was not the person who invented Emacs, or at least not the first incarnation of Emacs. I think James Gosling, who might be the creator of Java also or something related to that, uh, was the creator of Emacs, but that wasn't a Lisp-based environment like we enjoy today. It was more like a, a, a an editing program that had macros for editing. I don't exactly know what they were written in. Someone in the chat probably does know, and they can they can yell it out. But um, but GNU Emacs was an implementation of the same ideas of of Emacs, the original Emacs, but using Lisp as the extension language. Um, so that became like one of the core editors or core programs of GNU, and it still is today. I mean, it's a very big part of GNU in my opinion because it embodies all of the the philosophy and practices of the GNU system. Um, so. Uh, what one thing that is sort of central to the GNU project is this concept of free software. And you've probably heard the, the term free software before uh, on the internet or on you know YouTube channels or any resource where people are talking about uh, the GPL or maybe GNU or Linux or whatever. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, free software is basically a philosophy in that, let's see if it opens it here. 
uh, in that basically there's, there's four essential freedoms, basically the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. So basically, if there's a program that is written as free software, you should be able to use it however you wish. Uh, also, the freedom to study how it works and change it to it so it does your computing as you wish. So basically, you, you're able to read the source code to understand how it works, and then you can also change the program to suit your purposes. Sounds like Emacs, right? Um, access to the source code is a precondition for that one. Uh, the freedom to re redistribute copies so that you can help others. So basically, if you have a copy of the program, you should be able to give it to someone else without there being any kind of restriction or le legal ramifications for that. Uh, also, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. So basically, if you make enhancements to the program, you should also be able to give that enhanced version to somebody else without any kind of legal ramifications to you. Uh, so basically, by doing this, you sort of level the playing field on what software is available, what functionality is available to other people. And uh, it, it makes it so that the community can sort of organically grow up solutions around certain problem areas and build, build programs that work effectively for those problem areas. And people who have different, differing ideas can have different versions of the program with their own enhancements. Or you can just have your own private version of the program that you have your own enhancements on. And maybe you take some changes from the, the real program at some point and then integrate them into yours. You can do whatever you want. So for people like us, for the people who are on this channel, System Crafters in this community, uh, this kind of thing actually is important because the whole idea here is that you want to be able to craft your computing experience to whatever your use case is or however you see, however you want to use your computer. So the idea of free software is very important because it respects your freedom to choose how you use your computer and not basically use your computer in the way that someone else decided for you. Uh, it also gives you the ability to think about how you would want to improve a program that you use and also share that improvement with someone else. So, you know, it's kind of um, not useful if you are making improvements to a program and not sharing them because other people might be able to benefit from that. And this is sort of why, you know, maybe the free software and open source community has started to flourish since, you know, like the late 90s to now because people like being able to share their creations and have other people use them and give feedback and also make contributions. So free software, the free software movement was sort of the genesis for all of this uh, wealth of software that we have today that's either under free software licenses or just general open source licenses. Uh, so I guess the next question is, um, since we did mention like the, the, the free software in general, let's talk about the GPL license. I'm going to talk about this briefly. I actually do want to talk about it more at length in another video or maybe a stream. But the GPL is a license that codifies these principles for uh, free software. So basically, you um, should have the ability to have the code, make changes to the code, share your changes to the code, and redistribute the actual binaries of the program. Um, so this is basically comprises what the, the GPL license is for. There's various different versions of the GPL license, but they, they all basically have that same, the same principles at core. So then the question becomes, OK, the idea was, should uh, we want to make a system called GNU, which is basically an operating system, a set of free tools that comprise an operating system, uh, and we want them to be freely shareable. So does that mean that all GNU software is inherently licensed as GPL? Well, no. There's actually some GNU software that isn't licensed as GPL. Uh, and there's also software that's licensed as GPL that uh, isn't GNU software. So it really just depends on whether a person was uh, developing a piece of software with the GNU project in mind. Like they actually wanted to contribute to the GNU project so that they add to this sort of ecosystem of software under the GNU banner. Uh, but if anybody can release software license under the GPL and it doesn't have to be titled GNU. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to, to think about that, you know, basically a so piece of software can be MIT licensed in theory and also be a GNU software. I don't, ex I don't exactly know which softwares of GNU are not GPL licensed, but there must be some out there because otherwise the website for GNU wouldn't mention that, uh, as being in the case. Uh, the next thing, which is a, a thing that basically shows up quite a lot is that people say that you shouldn't call Linux an operating system, that you should say that it's GNU Linux. And honestly, I agree with this, because Linux is merely a kernel. And a kernel is um, basically just the interface between the software on the computer and the hardware. So basically the drivers for all of the devices that you have, um, the process scheduling, how processes are executed, um, the, you know, interfacing with the CPU, 
uh, interfacing with the memory. So basically all the interfacing with the hardware is done in the kernel and Linux is just a kernel. It doesn't have any programs that come with it inherently. It's, it's just that interface between your software and your hardware. Uh, but it's a very important piece of software. And luckily, whenever uh, Linus Torvalds created it, he created it under the GPL license so that it, it does mesh well with the GNU project. So uh, at the time that he created the Linux kernel, the GNU project was already alive and it already was providing all these tools uh, as free software. So those two things were able to be put together to create a full distribution of the Linux kernel with an operating system, which was the GNU operating system. So GNU gives you all the tools needed to do basic usage of your computer. So like, you know, uh, creating files or setting permissions on files, changing the ownership of files, managing your disk partitions, uh, editing things, like basically all the stuff that you need to actually use your computer, GNU provided, and then the Linux kernel provided that hardware interface and together they made a complete Linux distribution. So around like, I would say the early to mid nineties, uh, you started to see a lot of Linux distributions appear uh, which used the GNU operating system or the GNU tool set to basically provide a complete uh, working environment to install on your computer. So um, uh, there's some people here in the channel and myself included were using Linux, GNU Linux in the 90s. And it actually was pretty useful. You could do a lot of things with it. It was, it was pretty amazing. And since then, basically, it's built into a real competitor against other major operating systems. Uh, but what people sort of forget is that GNU is a major component of that. All the GNU core tools are are central to the success of the Linux kernel just because uh, they otherwise it would just be a kernel. There wouldn't be any software to run with it. Now, maybe there was other software around. I know that the BSD operating systems uh, were around. Um, and I think they were also doing a similar thing where they wanted to have their own free version of, of BSD since BSD wasn't free initially. Um, so maybe that stuff could have been used, but I think Linux, I don't know. I, I don't know why GNU and Linux were put together in the beginning, but I know that, um, they, they basically went hand in hand and, you know, basically made all this great stuff that we have today. So let's see what the chat has to say right now. So let's see. Todd Fisher says, Gosling Emacs used something called mock lisp. Yeah, you're right. I think that I, I have heard that. Uh, Garjola says Tico was the editor for which the Emacs macros were created. Yep, definitely. Uh, I, I've never seen the Tico editor before, but what I understand is that the Tico editor was where uh, editor macros were sort of first coming about. Uh, Bashcript says, uh, new subscriber here. Thank you to finally learn how to debug code using Emacs. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, Astrocat mentions a lot of open source projects are getting infected with activists trying to limit who can participate in and even use it. We should have a conversation about that another time. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing going on. Um, let's see. Lord Devi says Linus himself thinks that GNU went crazy, though, when they made GPL v3. He wouldn't have used v3. Yeah, v3 is different in certain ways. I don't actually know all the differences between v3 and the prior versions, but uh, something I would be interested to look into and talk about one day. Uh, BSD migrated to GCC eventually. FreeBSD free seems to adopt Clang. Um, <laughs> and Zaml says, my dad gave me Linux in middle school because I kept bricking my Windows XP. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's going to be less possible to do that, but maybe. So, uh, yeah. So basically, it may sound like hair splitting whenever we talk about wanting to say GNU Linux rather than just Linux. But really, you can't have Linux without GNU, at least, you know, in the early days. I don't know if there's like a replacement to GNU that someone else may have been, may have written that has another set of core tools that you could use, but GNU is kind of the standard as far as the operating system tools for the Linux kernel is concerned. And uh, the GNU website obviously has its own page to uh, make this distinction for themselves uh, if it decides to load up. So if you want to check that page out, uh, Richard, <clears throat> excuse me, Richard Stallman basically gives the information about how Linux and GNU relate to each other and also some some history basically. So that's another little interesting piece of uh, information. There's a lot of stuff on this website that you should check out if you want to learn more about uh, the GNU operating system and free, the free software philosophy in general. There's, there's just tons of articles here, many of them written by Richard, Richard Stallman. Um, it's, it's really kind of inspiring to read some of this stuff. So uh, another question, is all software on Linux part of GNU? Well, no, it's not. Um, more and more of it is independently developed. I mean, like over the years, there's been lots and lots of software being developed for uh, for Linux uh, and GNU, basically. 
Um, but many programs are still licensed under the GPL, even though they aren't GNU projects specifically, and mainly because people who use Linux often sort of appreciate the uh, principles of free software, and they use Linux, Linux and GNU Linux because of um, this sort of philosophy. So uh, people will create their own programs using the GPL or another copyleft license like that so that uh, people can have the same sort of freedoms that they enjoy themselves when using uh, GNU Linux. Hey, Piotr, no problem. So let's talk a little bit about what software actually comes in the GNU ecosystem. I mean, not every piece of GNU software is going to be installed on a GNU Linux distribution. However, uh, a lot of things will be there by either by default or like as a base part of the, the distribution. So there's actually a complete list on this page, which is kind of interesting to look at because you get to see kind of the scope of all of the, um, uh, the software that's there. I'm going to move this over to Workspace 2. This is getting a little annoying. Sometimes my, my rules for window placement aren't working, apparently. But you can check out this page, and there's just a whole list of stuff here. It doesn't really tell you what all these are, but if you click on the various pages, they will take you to the, ver the various links. They will take you to the page that describes a the project. There's also, also some decommissioned GNU packages, usually because either the maintainer stepped away or because there's better packages that were created um, that replaced them. So some of those might be interesting for historical context, but they aren't necessarily something you would probably use these days. But um, generally, oh, uh, uh, Asayake makes a good point that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, generally, uh, the things that you are most familiar with on uh, GNU Linux would be things like core utils. Now, core utils isn't necessarily something where you understand um, what that name implies, but it's actually a lot of the core programs that you use uh, on GNU Linux. So uh, another thing listed here is Bash. So core utils and Bash kind of go hand in hand and you probably can't tell where one ends and the other begins because you're using core utils programs in Bash or, or a shell of some sort um, at any given time. However, some of the programs that you call are not actually commands in Bash, they're actually programs that you're calling that are part of core utils. So if we were to go look at um, this in the terminal, so I pulled up a Bash terminal here. And if I say which ls, well, it tells me um, that, let me just get the, let me follow the symbolic link in Geeks here. So read link, which ls. So it tells me that ls is part of core utils. So it's part of the core utils package uh, in, in Geeks and in basically every other distribution. If we were to check out the, um, the directory here, ls, we'll see, oh, it is a directory, come on. Oh, here we go. We'll see there's a variety of tools here that you probably recognize like make deer uh change owner chone or trut or ch chmaj group whatever you however you pronounce these a lot of these um, common programs that you run ln ls uh, pwd uh, cd is not part of this uh, because that's actually part of the shell but a lot of these things are part of the core utils package and this is kind of like the, the beginning of the GNU project like you need these programs to actually do work inside of um, a GNU Linux system or a Unix like system Unix compatible system. So um, then you have things like bash obviously which is a GNU project to provide a complete shell with some enhancements on the original sh shell I don't really know the history behind the sh shell but um, bash provides you with some enhancements there and also can emulate the the original sh shell as well I believe whenever you run it like that um, let's see what else do we have uh, GCC so the whole GCC compiler tool chain which compiles not only C and C++ but other languages as well is part of the GNU project and uh, it's a very important part because you can't build all the software that was made for GNU without a compiler so um, GCC was created uh, a long time ago was one of the core parts of the GNU project to make sure that the uh, the software could all be compiled. And as Felipe mentions, the Flex and Bison are also uh, some important parts of the sort of development tool chain as well, because you can write uh, basically language grammars using those tools, I believe. Um, none ask, what about systems with Muzzle, LibC, and BusyBox? Is BusyBox actually a base set of tools? Uh, I know Muzzle, LibC is a... Is a um, uh, a, a competitor or an alternative to GNU libc, um, which is useful in some ways. Um, I guess one interesting aspect of the GNU 
ecosystem, which muzzle, um, muscle, yeah, muscle libc actually deals with is that GNU actually expects you to have all of these libraries and programs set up so that they are using uh, dynamically linked libraries um, for everything. So they, they assume you're going to have the actual library for something installed. And a program would use those libraries on the system and not actually have all that stuff compiled into the binary statically so they could be run standalone. However, muscle, uh, muscle libc is actually a library that's created for the purpose of statically linking into your program so that you can distribute that program and run it on a machine that doesn't have the muscle C library already installed. So there's sort of different principles there at play. And I think that uh, uh, it's interesting. I actually I'm trying to use it for various projects because I think it's good to have standalone executables in some cases. Um, and Renzik uh, says, yeah, BusyBox can be used as an alternative. Good. I didn't know that. Uh, and Garjola says that uh, he, they think that maybe BusyBox is part of the GNU project. Let's see. BusyBox doesn't look, doesn't not listed here. BusyBox. Uh, yeah, seems to be separate. But they are GPL. Yep. FAC. What is BusyBox? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, yeah. So, basically, maybe it's an alternative to the GNU tool set. And um, as someone else mentioned, I think it's used on uh, Alpine Linux. Or maybe maybe Alpine can use it as an alternative to the GNU tools. Uh, sometimes people want a more minimalistic tool set. And it's things like BusyBox might be a solution for that. Um, so, uh, there's also tools that are like the around that are for around the tool chain of, of being a compiler. So, like GCC is only a compiler. But you also need a way to drive the operation of the compiler for a large software project. So you need something like make. And sometimes you also need tools like autoconf and automake, which are basically tools that can generate the configuration for or the make, make file for a project whenever the project gets even more complex. So there's like a whole software development ecosystem for GNU tools that's being used basically on every operating system. Uh, well, yeah, it's probably also being used on the BSDs. I'm not 100% certain on that. However, I know that at least on uh, GNU Linux and on Mac OS, you can use GCC very easily. And on Windows, you can use GCC through the uh, msys2 package and also SIGWIN as well. So it's a very common tool chain for uh, software development. It's great to have such a high quality C and C++ compiler available to everyone, basically. And obviously, we have Emacs, which is another big part of the GNU uh, tool set and ecosystem. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Emacs is the desktop environment of the GNU operating system. I don't know that many people would have the same opinion, but if you really think about all the stuff that's uh, included with Emacs, you probably will start to realize that it actually is meant to be more like a desktop environment because you've got Dear Ed for file browsing, you've got a shell built in, eShell, you've got uh, a text editor built in, which is basically the normal buffer editing, uh, you've got games built in, which is kind of surprising. Um, you've got the ability to do, make remote connections to other machines through Tramp. There's all kinds of things there that are sort of made for a person to actually live inside that environment and, and stay there all the time, not just use it transiently as like one tool in a tool set. So I do believe that Emacs was sort of intended to be the, uh, or at least it, my, my interpretation and opinion is Emacs was intended to be basically the desktop environment for Emacs, though it is originally a terminal application. So, you know, Make, make of that what you will uh, as far as like, the desktop metaphor is concerned but uh, but that's basically uh you know emacs has a big role because it is a, a really great user interface to using your computer uh, ahmed muhammad asks uh please how to change the the number line color in GU gui emacs well it depends on how you uh set up your your numbers if you use display line number mode display line numbers mode i believe there's a face for that if you use describe face and then look up uh once it finally loads uh let's see display or is it line numbers yeah line number probably that's line number if you change that face you can change the color uh pedro asks would you do a geeks guide on to your system as you've done with emacs uh you should watch for the video on monday we might start talking about geeks uh, some of these questions I'll, I'll wait until later. So maybe we'll ask, answer these later so we don't get too derailed from the topics we're talking about. So GNU Geeks. Since we, we just mentioned Geeks, let's talk about Geeks now. So in my opinion, um, Geeks is sort of like the next iteration of what it means for the GNU operating system in that 
it is a modern uh, GNU Linux distribution, and it's also a modern GNU package manager. It actually helps with this whole idea of having a system where you need to have all the libraries and dependencies installed for a program to execute. And it makes it very easy because uh, you can install this package manager in any Linux distribution, GNU Linux distribution, and then install packages the, the geeks way, which is, um, we won't go into the details, we'll talk about it on Monday, but basically it makes it uh, a lot more robust and stable. And um, if you run into problems, you can reverse things very easily. So uh, it is kind of like the best way to use the GNU operating system. Uh, it also is very hackable. All the source code for all the packages is very hackable and it's all available. And the the distribution and the sort of the management of the whole project is very focused on free software and ensuring that nothing that's going to violate your privacy or your freedom is included into the main GNU Geeks repository. So uh, there's other GNU centric and free software centric distros like I think GNU Trisquel and um, there's a few others. I can't remember the names of them at the moment, but I believe GNU Geeks may be the 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 more iconic one in the sense that it really does um, bring all of the GNU philosophies and practices into play. One of the other big deals about it is that everything for the com the configuration of using Geeks and the code of Geeks itself is written in in Scheme in the Guile Scheme language, uh, which is a Lisp. So you have Emacs, which is configured and written basically using a Lisp, and then you have Guile Scheme, uh, which is a Lisp that's used for GNU Geeks, which is basically how you control your whole system. So um, if you want the ultimate hackable system where all the source code is available and it respects your freedom and privacy, then you know using the GNU operating system and specifically the GNU Geeks distribution of Linux, uh, it's basically it can't be beaten because you can do anything you want to do and you have full control. So we're going to get into that uh, in a lot more detail uh, as we get into the GNU Geek series and sort of talk about what it does, why it works, those kinds of things. But uh, for now, just know that I think GNU Geeks is sort of like the new standard as far as uh, GNU distributions are concerned. Uh, Eric Dyer asked, does GNU Geeks interface nicely with your distribution's native package manager? It is a completely separate package manager and it does not use any of the packages that come from your uh, native distribution's package manager. So it installs everything that it needs on its own. Uh, which is kind of weird, but um, if you think about it, Flatpak and Snap, they all do the same thing. They're basically pulling in all their own standard dependencies and not really using what comes on the machine other than maybe very low-level libc or something. So um, it's this is kind of a new standard that's emerging where a package manager would sort of take care of its own ecosystem and then you could use it somewhere else. NixOS is very similar, or sorry, the Nix package manager is very similar in this in this regard. Uh, Eric asks, uh, what's the command to install a package on Geeks? It's just Geeks install uh, and then the name of the package. Uh, you don't have to add it to a text file. Um, let's see. Uh, Rainus asks, I just installed NixOS. How does NixOS compare to Geeks in terms of advancing GNU? I could just install Geeks OS and combine that with the Nix package manager. Um, NixOS is not a GNU um, project or distribution. It's more about how the whole process for having an immutable package manager and mm, declarative system configuration tool would work. GNU Geeks was directly inspired by Nix and also I think uses some core code from Nix as well or was based on some core code from Nix. So they're they're very similar in approach and even in some internal implementation. Uh, it's just that the um, the manifestation of the configuration language is different because um, NixOS is using something more like Haskell as a language. It's not actually Haskell, but it's something like Haskell, I think. And then GNU Geeks is using Scheme. It's using an actual programming language of Scheme that you can use to uh, write package definitions, write system configuration, etc. So you have a full programming language at your disposal uh, with GNU Geeks, which I think is amazing. Uh, Myself and uh, Benoit on the on the System Crafters Discord are talking pretty frequently about how to write Geeks packages and whatnot. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. So let's see. Yes, uh, Anders says like the package managers for different programming languages. Uh, we will uh, talk about that in the Geeks video. And hi, Anders. Uh, but yeah, basically it's actually. Uh, oh yeah, that's a good point. But it, Geeks can also be a package manager for other languages as well, which is actually kind of interesting. Okay, so we mentioned Guile Scheme before. Guile Scheme is a also it's a, a, excuse me a big part of the GNU ecosystem because 
Guile Scheme was created explicitly for the purpose of providing an extension language to programs. So basically like Emacs Lisp is to Emacs, uh, the people in the GNU community wanted to have that same kind of ultimate extensibility and hackability in other GNU programs. So Guile Scheme was created as a language that would provide that to arbitrary programs. So basically it's very embeddable into C programs. It's very easy to have Guile Scheme be brought into your program as a scripting language for your program, basically. And you can wire it up very easily just using some C functions, basically. And uh, uh, many of the GNU programs or the more elaborate programs like GNU Cache or GNU Lily P Pond or some other programs like that, they actually do allow you to script it with Guile Scheme, which I think is pretty amazing. And as we mentioned, GNU Geeks is all written with Guile Scheme. So um, Guile Scheme is basically the, the hacker's language of uh, of the GNU project. It's meant for you to craft your uh, your environment and also your programs to do what you want so you don't have to use C program code and compile your programs to make those changes. You can actually just hack the, the interface with the Guile scheme language. Someone asks, what's programming? Uh, yeah, good question. Basically, you're writing code that makes your computer do fun things. And code is just words that uh, the computer can interpret into uh, into ones and zeros. Uh, Eric Lunset says, it's the GNU Lua. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could say that. Basically, Lua was, was meant to be an embeddable scripting language for programs, and uh, Guile Scheme is similar in that it was meant to be an embedded scripting language. However, Guile has a lot of other interesting properties, which are um, that it can load other languages. In, well, in theory, it can load other languages. It was, was designed so that you can have a JavaScript interface to Guile where you can actually load some version of JavaScript into the Guile interpreter and run it. You can also run, uh, load and run Python to some degree. And they've also had some efforts to make Emacs Lisp work in it. However, the semantics of uh, Scheme and Emacs Lisp don't really match up. So I think that that isn't super successful, but it's something that has, that has been at attempted uh, with the purpose of trying to get Guile to be the default language in Emacs rather than Emacs Lisp, but that's never really succeeded. Uh, Astrocat says, uh, Scheme is like Lisp. Scheme is a dialect of Lisp that is different in a lot of ways. Um, it's meant to be a lot more minimalistic and more um, computationally oriented uh, and more functionally oriented, I guess you could say. Uh, it's very interesting. I actually like it better than Lisp or Common Lisp. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and I, I mentioned that there's other applications uh, that are part of the GNU ecosystem, like GNU Cache. Uh, the GNU Image Manipulation Program, uh, the GIMP, basically, um, that is a, an amazing program. It's basically a Photoshop competitor that's been around for a very long time. I was using the GIMP to make images back in like 1997 uh, for a website I was doing. So it's been around forever. Um, and it also is script scriptable with um, Tiny Scheme. It's not Guile Scheme in that case, but you can actually script the GIMP with uh, Tiny Scheme, which is pretty cool. I did a little bit of that. So uh, it sort of goes back to that ethos again, of like having free software that has really useful functionality and also is extensible using a very hackable programming language so that you can do whatever you need to do with it is just make it ultimately useful. Uh, Lily Pond, if you haven't heard of Lily Pond, it's actually really cool. It's basically a uh, program for um, what they call music engraving, but really it means uh, creating sheet music. So if you uh, know how to read sheet music, Lily Pond is a program that allows you to uh, use a, a language that's intended for creating sheet music for uh, for music. Basically, if you know how to write music or read music and you wanted to have a page like this of the actual musical notation, there's a language that Lily Pond uh, presents to you that you can write that then gets turned into this nicely uh, formatted sheet music. So uh, if you are a composer, uh, this is a cool thing you can do. And you can write the Lily Pond um, script basically inside of Emacs and then uh, generate these nice images. There's also the GNU uh, Denimo package, which allows you to have a graphical editing environment for creating this kind of musical notation if you are so inclined. I actually tried to use it just a second ago before the stream, and uh, it seems a little bit alien of an interface to me, but that's just my opinion. So maybe it would work pretty well for you. But if you want something that's sort of like um, Sibelius, if you've ever used Sibelius for uh, writing sheet music on a computer, uh, this is something like that, basically. So you can just see that there's like all kinds of programs that are available in the GNU ecosystem that um, really interesting and useful in their own ways. 
and um, solve a lot of general problems. Like there's a GNU nutrition application. I don't really know what that does. It probably just like helps you track what food you're eating, etc. But I uh, haven't used that before. Uh, anything else that stands out? DJ GPP. That's funny. I used that way long ago for game development. It's sort of like a Windows um, GCC uh, package. Uh, Ghost script for creating documents. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, read line, which is used quite a lot in low-level uh, C programs for cr providing like you know line editing functionality for like shell programs, etc. Um, yeah, a lot of other really interesting stuff. Nano, if you've ever used the GNU Nano text editor before on uh, uh, GNU Linux machine, whenever you've broken something, you had to to use that. Oh, there's a, another interesting thing to mention. That's actually a good segue to um, another comment that was brought up before. So. Um, even though the Linux kernel is um, GPL licensed, it does contain, the actual distribution of the Linux kernel contains binary firmware blobs, which are basically proprietary drivers that are included in the kernel source that are used for um, proprietary hardware that you might install or you might have on a machine on which you want to install Linux. So for instance, if you use a modern laptop, it's very likely that it has hardware that requires binary, sorry, proprietary drivers that are not free software. And the only way that you can use GNU Linux on your, your laptop is to have this uh, proprietary binary firmware blob that gets installed with a Linux kernel. So the, the code of the Linux kernel can still be GPL free software, but the um, the firmware blob is basically just like a text encoding, if I'm understanding correctly, of the binary information of a um, of a firmware, and it's you can't really disassemble that to understand what it's doing unless you use some tools and you know what you're doing to do that. But uh, it, it it sort of violates the principle of openness in that sense. So yeah, and yes, as uh, Peter mentions, uh, Wi-Fi and graphics cards are the worst offenders. Absolutely. So um, there is an alternative uh, version of the Linux kernel called the Linux Libre kernel, which basically just rips out all of the proprietary firmware blobs out of the kernel. And this is actually the kernel distribution that's being used in GNU Geeks by default. Uh, this causes a major problem to people who want to install GNU Geeks for the first time on a laptop or on a desktop PC, which uses a, uh, a Wi-Fi card that uses like a Broadcom chip because you don't have the drivers necessary to actually use your internet on a machine after you get Geeks installed. So basically you try to install Geeks and you can't use the internet, so you can't update your software and you can't really use it for anything in the modern era. So um, it can be problematic. However, there are manufacturers that do have free software drivers or there's efforts to develop free software drivers for um, some chips, like let's say the Nouveau driver for NVIDIA chipsets. It's not as fast because they don't have access to all the proprietary tricks that are being used in the hardware, but it's, it is something that's possible to use if you have a, an NVIDIA card. Um, but, you know, if you really want to have a fully free software machine top to bottom, you need to have hardware that works with the Linux Libre kernel, because uh, otherwise you're going to be using uh, the, the full Linux kernel that has the proprietary blobs. Now, it's really up to you about whether you care about this or not. For me, I would much rather have a really nice laptop, modern laptop, and um, and not worry too much about the uh, the binary firmware blobs because I I enjoy using a modern ThinkPad um, with you know modern CPU etc. Uh, and that's just my choice. But if, if you don't like that, if you don't really want to support people who are making these proprietary devices with proprietary drivers that they won't make them free software, then it's up up to you to decide to not support them. So. Uh, this is another place in our sort of system crafting experience where we get to choose whether something matters to us or not. Uh, so it's just another good thing to know about that. You know, the Linux kernel itself is not, it's its free software, but it's not really free whenever you look at it with a, a more uh, discerning eye. So use the Linux Libre kernel uh, if you want to have a fully uh, Linux system. I think that you will... Uh, see that if you try to use uh, Debian, the Debian Linux distribution, you will also have the same problem. That I, I tried installing Debian one time and ran up against this because Debian is a very strongly free software GNU Linux distribution, and they also use Linux Libre by default. Uh, yeah, so Anders says the same thing, basically, that uh, about free Linux, use Debian without non-free packages. And there's also the possibility of GNU Herd. So if you don't know about Herd, 
Herd is an alternative kernel implementation that's being has been under development since probably the early 90s. Um, and it hasn't been so successful, but it is something to keep an eye on because maybe in the future it will be better. However, it's still going to have the same problem in that the uh, it won't have drivers for a lot of the modern hardware that you might want to use on a laptop computer. Um, but, you know, there's active development happening. I mean, the news here only mentioned since 2019, but I know that the GNU Geeks project has been doing some work to try to get uh, the herd kernel to work if you want to use it. They also did a nice little April Fool's joke, maybe the year before last, where they basically tricked everyone into thinking they were switching exclusively to Herd, which uh, gave me a heart attack because I like using Geeks a lot and I don't want to have to use Herd, but uh, uh, that's just sort of, you know, programmer humor sometimes. All right. Yeah, uh, AstroCat says you just have to pick hardware carefully. Yeah, you definitely have to pick hardware carefully. And um, some of these... Um, uh, distributions like Debian, as John, uh, Jean-Noël mentions, uh, there's a non-free repository in case you do want to have some non-free programs and drivers, uh, which is totally something you can do. I mean, I really think that the concept of uh, freedom should include the use of proprietary software if you decide that it's something you want. So I think that it's kind of... Uh, there, there's an ideological debate to have about whether proprietary software should be usable on a free software distribution but i feel like you know true freedom means you should be able to do that all right i think that's uh was that everything for for gnu so does anybody else have any other thoughts about gnu or free software in general that you want to bring up before we move on to the next topic i mean um at least for me gnu and gnu linux have made a huge impact on my life i started using gnu linux um probably in 96 or 97 when I started using Slackware Linux uh, for the first time. And uh, it sort of opened my eyes to the fact that you don't have to use Windows. I mean, I really liked Windows at the time because it's all I really knew, but you don't have to use Windows or you don't have to use the Macintosh or whatever. Um, you can use something else that is a little bit more exciting and interesting and where you have to kind of learn things yourself. So uh, I feel like it's a great environment to learn more about the computer, learn more about programming and to just have freedom in deciding what you want to do with your computer, which is amazing. Uh, Garzola says Debian does not use the Linux Libre kernel. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But uh, it felt like I didn't have a driver that I needed whenever I installed it. So it could just be that I didn't have the non-free uh, repository enabled. Felipe was using 96 uh, Debian in 96. Yeah, Debian was the other big one. I don't know why I didn't try Debian back in 96. For some reason, I got the impression that for some reason it was easier to use and I didn't want to use it for that reason. It's kind of a stupid reason. But whenever you're a teenager, you do things for dumb reasons. Uh, Raspberry Pi are not free. It needs blobs for video. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think it has Widevine or something uh, for for DRM. All right, so uh, the next topic actually dovetails nicely from the previous topic in that um, there is a new project, or it's not really new. It's been going on for about two years now called Source Hut. And Source Hut is a new... Well, I keep saying new. It's a, um, a website and a set of tools for doing collaborative development using decentralized version control software like Git or Mercurial. Um, the interesting thing about SourceHut is that it was developed specifically in response to um, the problems that the creator, Drew DeVault, had with uh, GitHub and GitLab. Uh, basically, like he thought that the way that things were being done there actually was um, antithetical or sort of in contradiction to the way that software has been developed on GNU Linux or for GNU Linux for years. And I think he wanted to go back and try to figure out if um, the old email driven development model could be sort of revolutionized for the modern age with some better tooling so that we have a better environment for doing this kind of collaboration on free software projects. So I've been looking into this project over the last couple of days and I think it's pretty amazing. It's kind of inspiring actually. So I wanted to kind of talk about it a little bit today and show some things about it just to maybe see if you're interested in trying it out. So the reason why I mentioned that it dovetails with GNU is because this is another instance where uh, the creator of something did it because of their own sort of philosophical reasons or ethical reasons. They felt like the, um, the software being used at the time was did not live up their, to their own principles. 
So they decided that instead of complaining about it, they were going to go and do something about it. So just as Richard Stallman went and created uh, the GNU project, because he didn't like the way that the licensing of software was happening, Drew DeVault did not like how these uh, Git forges, like uh, GitHub and GitLab, were starting to centralize, even though GitLab is free software, it does a similar thing, where it starts to centralize all this information about a decentralized software uh, software source control uh, program, basically. It, it's, it's centralizing something that is inherently meant to be not decentralized. So if you don't know much about Git, Git was actually created um, by uh, Linus Torvalds, who is the person who created the Linux kernel, uh, pr specifically for actually making it easier to contribute to Linux, to manage patches against the Linux kernel. So um, originally it was a lot more elemental of a tool as it is now than it is now. Uh, it was specifically meant for dealing with patch patches. So whenever you make a change to a piece of software that you want to contribute to the maintainers of that software, you would write the code and then you would create a patch file which is basically like a textual version of a diff of the changes that you could email to someone they could take a look at that and then decide if they want to apply it to the code repository and then commit it and push it to where everyone else can get the changes so this has been the model that has been used for both the gnu project and for uh, linux the linux kernel for as long as they've been going on and people have been pretty happy with that and, you know, since a lot of this was being done over email, everybody was free to use their own email client for interacting with the mailing list where all the patches were coming from and all the communication about the project was being done over email. Uh, you know, the way the email works is you, you're syncing that email to your computer, at least in, in the past, whenever people were still doing that uh, primarily. You would have a history of all the communication and patches for a given project. So you would have it on your local machine and you wouldn't have to be on the Internet to look at all that stuff. Uh, you would be able to use your own tools to interact with it however you wanted. And it was kind of great for that reason, because it's using these dis these centralized protocols and it's not locking you into a specific platform. Anyone has their own email server. Emails are getting sent between these servers. You're, you're not using one central server that mediates everything that's happening. So uh, the Git source control program was made as an interface to simplify this whole patch driven workflow and also email driven patch workflow because there's a command in in git that you can install basically that's like git send email where you can actually send an email from git with your pack uh, with your patch to the upstream upstream maintainer of the program you're trying to contribute to it's it's made specific, specifically for this purpose now as git grew in popularity and sites like github were created they started changing the development workflow that was used for git instead of sending patch files over email they started having these websites where you push your entire repository to your user account and then you're you're contributing patches in that way which is totally fine and many of us are actually used to doing that now but uh it's sort of like takes a, the design of a, of a contribution workflow that worked really well in the past and then completely changes it almost arbitrarily just to suit a website driven workflow um th there's definitely pros and cons to having a website driven workflow. I mean, it's nice to have a good interface for being able to, to um, review changes that someone's trying to contribute to a project and then merge them easily. Um, and it also is more approachable for people who necessarily aren't familiar with using email primarily, or maybe they are used to just using websites for everything. So it has benefits. However, I feel like um, what Drew has, has come to the conclusion here is that the old email driven workflow was actually great for a lot of reasons. It respects your freedom a lot better, but it does actually need some improvements so that more modern developers can um, understand it better and use it more, more easily. So I think Source Hut was created with this goal in mind to, to go back to a more freedom respecting and email driven contribution workflow while still uh, having a more modern interface that is something that you can go to and look at. I don't know um, if you've seen the um, the archives for mailing lists for GNU projects like GNU Geeks or GNU Emacs. Those interfaces are very hard to use. Uh, in fact, let's just go look one up really quickly just to make that point. So Emacs-Devel uh, mailing list. Let's see if we can pull that up really quickly. So the point I want to make here is that um, all this... Uh, co communication about these projects is, are being doing, done on mailing lists, which isn't inherently bad. However, the interfaces for looking at these things is kind of like really outdated and hard to use. So you can look at all the um, the threads that have been going on over time for Emacs Devel, 
if I look at the thread listing, you have this big page of links uh, with threads, which, okay, that's not so bad. You can see how they're nesting, how the conversations are happening. But then once you find an individual link, sometimes you don't have this nice listing here. Sometimes you have to look down here in this list to, to see the next mail in the thread. It really just depends on whether somebody replied to a mail properly or whether it happened in a certain month or whatever. I mean, it's, it's not ideal to have the UI like this necessarily. I mean, it's usable. You can learn to use it, but it's very alien to anyone who's used to modern uh, websites for doing contribu contribution to code projects these days. So uh, I think SourceHut is trying to uh, attack this from a different way, like have a better user interface that uses the same technologies under the end. Basically, you have a mailing list, but make it look better so that someone is able to understand it and search it and use it more easily. Let's see what the chat has to say. Um, Eric says, can I have a repo hosted to source hut and GitLab at the same time? You absolutely can because Git is decentralized. You can just push it to whatever host you want. Um, but you're going to have to push it to both of them. If you want to keep them both in sync. Um, let's see. Uh, Garzola says federation and de decentralization email instead of discord peer tube instead of YouTube. Yeah. I mean, uh, we use Discord for the system crappers community because it's convenient. However, uh, I regularly think about what we could do to use maybe Matrix instead or something else because, um, you know, even though Discord is fun, I, I prefer to use something that was a little more friendly to the kind of tools that we use. Um, PeerTube instead of YouTube. Yeah, I mean, uh, YouTube has a lot of reach and that's the main reason why a lot of people are using it. But if someone could create a PeerTube instance that was popular enough that a lot of people used it, then maybe it would be an alternative. Um, yeah, Appenzell says IRC is nice for its time, but Matrix is the future. A lot of stuff still happens on IRC, surprisingly, but I think Matrix is sort of a better middle ground between IRC and something like Discord. All right, so let me just have a sip of water here. And we'll move forward. So let's take a, this, take a look at the SourceHut website. This is actually the main sort of marketing site for SourceHut. And they kind of give you a description of all the features that are available here. I mean, it's not a bad looking site. It's 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 kind of nice, kind of simple. Um, and they, they tell you that it has a lot of different functionality that is actually something you might be uh, looking for from another host like GitHub or GitLab. Uh, so you have a lot of those great things. You can sign up for free right now it's available as a public alpha. And what that means is you don't have to pay to use it now, but at some point in the future, they're going to make it pay only, but they have a, um, uh, like three different plans. Uh, one that's $2 a month, one that's $5 a month and one that's $10 a month. And they're basically using this to fund the development of the project. I'm going to start paying to use this project just because I, I like it and I want it to succeed. I want the people to continue to be able to work on it. Um, but you don't have to pay for it to use it right now. So it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and also it's written with 100% free and open source software. So basically all the code for the site is uh, made available to you. You can contribute to it as much as you want, um, which is great. Uh, you can run it yourself if you want. Um, similarly, Git, GitLab is free and open source software as far as I know. You can run it yourself too, but it doesn't have the same principles as SourceHut does. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, so let's see, what else do I want to say? So I let's take a look at the actual site for this. I mean, this is sort of like the marketing site and it doesn't look like what is on the real uh, sr.ht site for um, the repositories and everything. So what I'm going to do is open up the page that I created for System Crafters. I, I created a System Crafters account on uh, SourceHut. And this is going to take me directly to the, um, the Git repository uh, listing basically for the System Crafters account. So uh, you can't really see it here. I'm going to drop it into the chat really quickly so that you can go there if you want to. But the um, the URLs for this site are kind of funky in that it's uh, HTTPS colon slash slash git dot sr dot ht slash tilde, then the name of the user. So tilde system crafters. Um, but uh, basically, when you go there, you can see the listings of the repositories that are uh, owned by the uh, the account. You can go to repositories. You can look at the listing of commits uh, for the repository you're looking at. So you can look at the file tree. You can look at the uh, the commit log. Uh, you can look at the, the refs, which are basically the branches. And there's also settings for the repository, uh, as you would normally expect. There's also um, 
RSS for the commits. So if you wanted to follow the development on a project without having to get email notifications or something, you can just use an RSS reader, which is another great thing because now you can use LFeed or something in Emacs to get um, notified about changes to a project just using RSS without having to use some kind of thing in the website to get notifications. So instead of getting emails, you can just go read RSS instead, uh, which goes back to this whole idea of, of using decentralized uh, protocols and uh, technologies. Uh, you can look at uh, commits to see the uh, the diff, which right now you can't see it very well. And this is a small diff, so you can't see it, uh, what it would look like for a full diff, but at least you can see that there's, you know, the diff markers and whatnot. Very simple interface, but I would argue that um, the interface of the site is not necessarily meant to be used primarily. I think that the intention is that you would be using your own local tools to look at everything like the Git repository or the emails and the mailing list, etc. So um, the I think that the UI doesn't have to be super complex or super capable because of the uh, the fact that it you have other tools you can use to interact with these things. Um, now, if I wanted to submit a patch to this repo, what would I do? Well, there's a patch button here. Um, let's see. Oh, that's actually the patch file. But so you can download that and apply it yourself if you want to, basically. But to contribute to this thing, you actually have to uh, use email to send a patch. So let me see if I click prepare a patch set, what does it do? So, oh, it's interesting. I actually can create one for you. I didn't know this. So, so some of this stuff I'm learning for the first time while we're looking at it here. Let me just click continue. What does it do? So, oh, it makes a patch set, which is like a, a listing of patches. You can add a cover letter with the, the changes. Let's see, hit, hit continue. Oh, so it does it for you, which is great if it does. Cool, so maybe there actually is something like a pull request flow on the site, so you don't have to use all email for it. Um, I think what this actually does is send an email to the maintainer of the site with that patch file, but um, it's kind of great if, uh, if they can help you do that without you having to do it yourself, because then it makes it more like what you would see on GitHub or GitLab where you have that whole pull request workflow that you can use. And Garjola says they use the tilde because this is your home directory. Yeah, it's sort of like that old home directory style with older uh, web servers. Uh, Astrocat asks, how is doing patches by email better than doing them over SSH? Well, it's not really that you're doing them over SSH as you're using a centralized website to do them because um, you have to push it to a website and tell someone to, to review it and then pull it into the repository. At least with a patch, you can send it to their email. They can re read it in their email. Then they can use that patch file and apply it to their local repository, test out your changes, or they don't even need to test them. They can just read the, read the diff and see what they think about it. Um, I feel like you can use the inbuilt, inbuilt tools that you already have and not um, have to use some third party site to do all of the work which gives you more freedom in the tooling that you're using and the way that you would prefer to work. So it's better than having to use a third party site, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, Noel asks, what's the language running this site? I think the site's written in Go. But the interesting thing to note about the site is that um, it, it has basically no JavaScript. Uh, I think that's another one of the principles they have there is they don't want the site to, to require JavaScript which also means you can load this site up in the inbuilt browser in Emacs, EWW. So if we look at um, EWW, let's see if I can type this in correctly, HTTPS colon slash slash uh, git.sr.ht slash uh, tilde system crafters. Let's see what it does. So yeah, you can basically pull this site up in EWW in Emacs because it doesn't use JavaScript and because the layout of the site is so simple. You could actually look at source hut repositories using the website in Emacs without a, a normal browser. Let's actually uh, check this out a little bit more. Uh, I'll go into this community repo. I'll look at one of the diffs. And uh, yeah, you can see basically that there's plus signs here for the added lines for the diff. You don't get to see any of the highlighting what sucks, but um, you actually can see all the same information uh, as you do on the website, no problem, just using the inbuilt browser. Uh, and I think that's because the guy who made the site also appreciates being able to do things in the terminal. So it would also work for terminal-based web browsers. Um, so it's it's interesting to have that as a capability in case you did prefer, you prefer to use it that way. 
let's see, does we have the fine. No, it doesn't work. Okay. So uh, yeah, you can do all sorts of stuff here. I think even you could log in in theory because they're not using anything fancy. There's no like single page application here. It's just a normal website with cookies for authentication. Uh, you could sign in and then use the website just directly from within Emacs. So I think it's quite amazing, uh, to be honest, that you have this capability if you want it. Uh, you don't have to load up your browser just to to interact with things, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, Garjola makes a good point, and uh, that's something I'm going to talk about in a minute. So let me get back to the the flow that I had in mind here. All right, so the features of Source HUD. Um, so we already talked about the Git and Mercurial, Mercurial repositories. I showed you a little bit of that. Um, they also have something that's becoming increasingly important on these uh, Git Forge web websites these days, which is being able to run um, continuous integration builds or basically automating the build for a project. So um, they have their own way of doing this, which is similar to what you see on other sites where there's like a YAML based uh, workflow configuration file for describing the steps that need to be taken to build a project. Um, and you can do all the same stuff. You could basically build releases of your packages for, for things, or you could um, automatically update the contents of a website or just, you know, run tests for your project, anything you want to do. The interesting thing about the CI builds on the site is that there's no Linux, sorry, there's no Windows and there's no Mac OS builds. It's all GNU Linux and BSD um, builds, basically. So if you are targeting GNU Linux and BSD for uh, your projects, you're going to be a lot more at home here. I don't think that BSD is very commonly represented on other uh, CI websites. So you can see the list of supported operating systems. Um, if we go to this website. So you have a lot of the things you would expect to see. Alpine Linux, Arch Linux, uh, Debian, Fedora, FreeBSD. You also have NixOS, which I think is really interesting. And it makes me wonder how hard it would be to get geeks in here as well. Because uh, one thing I would like to do is have a CI build that is able to create images of geeks for installation for people using a customized build of geeks, basically. So I'm going to try to look into that in the future to see if I can get geeks hooked up here. Uh, you also have OpenBSD, Ubuntu, and Ninefront, which is actually kind of interesting because apparently there's a group of people working on a revival of the Plan 9 operating system uh, on this site. So I think Ninefront is something related to that. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, you've got a lot of uh, architectures and um, distributions here that you can use for your builds. And it's really great for things like what I was saying, you know, automating some task you have. So it doesn't even have to really be building code. It could just be running any kind of task that needs to happen periodically. You can just kick off a build using the service, um, using the API, I think, or an email. And uh, you get uh, a, a thing that gets run in a VM and does some task and then d does whatever you want with it. So it's kind of amazing uh, to have this ability on a an, an independent sort of third party uh, Git forge like this website. So um, also mailing lists. So um, as we talked about a lot of the GNU projects or the GNU Linux kernel itself or the Linux kernel itself. Um, use mailing lists for the main way to communicate when uh, working on the project. Um, the Source Hut website does give you the ability to create mailing lists very easily so that people can subscribe to your mailing list and uh, communicate with each other through the mailing list. Also send patches for projects through mailing lists. So um, I've created one here that we can take a look at really quickly. <laughs> So um, this is actually a mailing list that you could you might want to subscribe to. This is um, one called System Crafters slash Announce. So it's basically like announcements for uh, the System Crafters community or for the YouTube channel or whatever. So we have this interface here, and there's only one email to the list so far, which is the one that I sent uh, this morning. If you click on it, you get a listing of the email itself, um, when it was sent, sort of the details about it, who sent it, etc. And uh, if this was an, a mailing list where you could reply to things, which this one isn't since it's just for announcements, but uh, you could reply to the thread. You can click reply to thread. But the thing is, it doesn't actually open up a an editor in the website to reply to this. If you you can't see it, but in the um, status bar at the very bottom of this uh, cute browser window, it actually has a mail to link. And what that means is that it's going to open your mail program so that you can reply to this as an email because this is an this is an email mailing list. It's not something where you're supposed to be using a website to store some entry in a database somewhere. You're using actual email. Not only that, for a given thread, you can export 
the actual mailbox messages so that you can open them in your mailbox program or your mail program locally on your machine. So uh, it's this very email centric, but it does have an interface. So you can go to the website and look at the archives in a much more readable way, which I think is really nice to have. Um, so to subscribe to these lists, uh, if you have an account on the website, uh, you can actually click subscribe. This this blue button will have subscribe here if you aren't subscribed yet, and you can automatically subscribe that way. Or you can just send an email to uh, let's see, did I actually list that here? No, I didn't. I didn't list it here. However, um, it's very easy to send an email to a specific email for this list. Sorry, a specific address for this list. So that oh, I have it in the email here. Yes, it's a uh, tilde system crafter slash announce plus subscribe. If you send an email with any subject, anybody, whatever to this uh, email address, you will be subscribed to this email address. And whenever I send an email to it, you will receive it. So uh, that's kind of a cool thing to just have. Well, it's not really for free because eventually you'll have to pay for it. But to have it so easily to make it so easy to create a list for any project or any purpose is kind of amazing. Uh, and also to have it, you know, all here, like all the the um, the history of the list will be here. And you can even set settings for a list to say who has access to it. So in this case, non subscribers, you can basically turn it off so that non subscribers to the list don't see the history. Uh, you can say that whether they can reply to it or uh, reply to messages or make new posts or even to have the ability to moderate the list. Same thing for subscribers to the list and also account holders. So anybody who has like a user permission, basically. Oh, to log in account holders of SHRT, SRHT accounts. So there's three different levels here. People who aren't subscribed, who are basically anonymous. There's people who are subscribed to the list who signed up for it, but aren't people who have an account on this website. And then people who actually do have an account on the website. So you have some granularity on how people can interact with your list, which I think is pretty useful, especially if um, you're trying to keep some things private if you want to. So that, that's kind of nice. So uh, anything else interesting to say about the mailing list? Whoa. Wow, this is a lot of spam here. So uh, I wonder if I can ban that person. Sorry, computer theist. We're going to say it's harassment. Who wants? Uh, yeah, let's say harassment. Oh, come on. Computer Theist, I'm just going to like hide you on this channel. How about that? Okay. I think that worked. Anyway, back to the point. Uh, so we have, uh, we've covered the mailing list thing. Uh, it's, it really, it's, it's not much more complex than that. Basically, you just have a mailing list that you can send emails to. Uh, however, these lists are actually a core component to how other things in the site work, like uh, sending package, uh, sending patches for contributions and also sending issues. So the uh, the issue tracker on uh, Source Hut, I don't have one here, but I think I have a li link to one. And uh, let's see, issue tracker. So I'll pull up this one really quickly. Whoa, what did I just do? Slowly, slowly coming up. Wow, it's taking 20 years for this thing to show up. Uh, whenever I have OBS running on this computer, things just get so slow. Okay, so now we see we have a full issue tracker interface on this site. There's actually issue numbers. There's uh, information. There's comments. There's like people who uh, filed the issues. Let's just click one of these and see what we can see here. So... We, uh, we can see here that there's an issue that's been reported. We see someone who submitted it, uh, the various information. There's even the possibility of adding labels. Uh, there's also all the comments here that have been sent, at, usually by emails. However, I think you can actually do comments um, via the website here as well. You don't have to do email for the comments. So that could be useful if you want to actually use the website to interact with um, the issues for a given project. However, uh, you can do email subscription and you can also enable email notifications for um, a particular issue by clicking enable notifications uh, let's see let me go back to the previous page uh, you can do enable notifications for the whole issue tracker i feel like there's a way to explicitly subscribe to the list for this as well but i can't see it right now uh, if, if i'm wrong about that someone tell me 
So uh, yeah, I think that uh, basically it can be a fully email driven issue workflow as well. There's also some documentation about the issue tracker where there's certain commands that you can send in emails to like close issues or to assign people to things. So uh, all the stuff can be done through email, which is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, uh, let's see, who said that? Uh, Ramsey says, uh, it would be difficult to succeed if it doesn't have a free tier like GitHub or GitLab. I would imagine that eventually they would have a free tier, but since it's basically two pe people working full time on this site, um, I think that it, at least at first, once they turn on the paid support, they're probably gonna have it be paid in the beginning so that they can sustain themselves. And then maybe in the future when they're successful enough, they could have a free tier of some degree. Okay, so next thing, uh, I think we, we covered the issue tracker. They also have wiki pages, but the wiki pages are a little bit different than what you see on GitHub. Hey, Archaic Lord. Uh, where you have to contribute to them using Git instead of uh, editing the site directly. I don't think there's a way to edit this site here because um, we have this wiki page, this main wiki page. I basically created a, a wiki on the uh, System Crafters uh, community repo basically and uh you can see i like edit this page there's actually a git, git commit with my changes to the page i think we actually saw that before in the system crafters community git repo but it's basically just a branch on um, this repository that gets turned into a wiki so if you have markdown files here in this branch then uh, so people can contribute to this by sending patches to the wiki branch of uh of this this repository so you're basically just syncing down the repository, the Git repository for the wiki and then making contributions to it as you would any other repository so that it shows up here. So I think that's a pretty interesting way to do a wiki. Uh, if you know anything about GitHub, actually they have this functionality too where their wiki is backed by a Git repository which you can sync and then com make commits to. But the difference is that on their website, they actually hide this behavior by just having a normal uh, graphical editing interface for the wiki pages. So you can just click edit and then edit the page and save it. So this is a little bit more of a barrier to entry to anybody who wants to contribute to your wiki, but it is possible for uh, external people to contribute to it as far as I understand. Uh, let's see, uh, build automation from other sites. This sort of fits in with the CI thing that I mentioned before, where if you have um, accounts on other sites, like let's say GitLab or GitHub, um, and you want to use uh, SourceHut for some of your builds, but maybe not all of them, maybe all of them, who knows, you could have it be uh, triggered the source hut builds based on commits or PRs to your GitHub or GitLab repositories. Um, I think there may be an API in general for accessing this so that you can trigger builds your own ways too. So it um, basically allows you to automate your builds using some external source, which is kind of interesting. Um, I could think of a lot of ways I might use something like this. So uh, it is uh, it's pretty pretty useful to have a way to trigger builds from external sites or from other things in general. Uh, they have a list of tasks that can be set up by default. Um, I feel like they must actually have an API for this. So let me just check that really quickly. Let's go to the man page. So we have this little menu up top that has the different sections of the site, which I'll talk about in a bit too. So we have like the repositories, the build system, the issue tracker, mailing list, and then man is where all the documentation is. So uh, let's see, where are we gonna look for? We're gonna look for the dispatch user manual. I think we're just looking at that, weren't we? Doesn't really tell us anything. Where's the API docs? Okay, so some of these have API references, others don't. The build system has an API reference. Let's see if we can uh, start a build that way. Yeah, they're saying it's, the API is due for an overhaul, probably because they're gonna change how everything works. Some of this stuff is like through a GraphQL API, so maybe that's why they're gonna change it. Uh, let's see, insert jobs. So yeah, basically you can create a job using a post request to the API, um, referring to the specific build manifest, the tags, when to execute it, what secrets to use, etc. So basically, if you wanna execute an arbitrary job, all it takes is just a re rest request to the endpoint. Um, <clears throat> which could be great for automating common tasks that you might have. Like for instance, for me, I would like to automate a task where if I get a new sponsor on either Patreon or GitHub, uh, I would like to be able to automatically kick off a job to, um, to rebuild like a sponsor's page or maybe do some automation to add them to sp certain groups or, or something like that. So, uh, or send an email even. So uh, there's, I think I could probably use this 
build system for some of those things as well. So I think it's a pretty awesome thing to have available to you um, as part of this website. All right, let's see what else. Okay, so there's also, um, if you used a uh, gist, gist, whatever you wanna call it on uh, GitHub before, um, Sourcelet has a similar paste functionality where you can basically have a um, uh, like single file hosting. Like you just have some file, maybe some error output or maybe like a single file of configuration you wanna share with somebody. You can go here and paste that file, make it public, unlisted or private and then save it so that it can be shared with somebody. So let's just see, can I just copy this list really quickly? Uh, let me paste it in here. Uh, some features of source hut. And then I'll make this uh, unlisted, I'll create a paste. And then I will copy this paste, I'm gonna drop it into the chat. And now you have it. So basically you, it just has a link that has a whole, you know, unique ID basically similar to how just has it so that you can share it with somebody else. So that's kind of useful. You can look at the raw of the file. Um, I guess you can manage it. Can you even update it? Yeah, it doesn't like you can really update it, but yeah. But it's useful if you want to share something with somebody uh, pretty easily. And uh, lastly, there is something new that just came up maybe last month, which is basically like the GitHub pages feature of GitHub, where if you want to host a static website, you can actually do that now from SourceHut, which I think is another really great, useful feature to have. However, it does have caveats, which I'll talk about in a second. So basically, um, if you understand how to manage a website that is using static resources like static pages, this is going to be very um, familiar to you because you don't actually have to like use a Git repository to have the files to be hosted. You can actually just use SCP or anything like that, I believe. Um, yeah, you're using curl to push a file, a, tar, a tar gzip file basically to uh, the endpoint for your site and then it just gets uploaded basically. So um, it's very simple and it's very easy to automate with their build system. So if you have a repository that represents a website, which I'm planning to do with a system crapper site in a bit, uh, you can, whenever someone pushes a commit to the site uh, repo, that build can then rebuild the static pages for the site and then display it on um, on the site that you've set up with your domain. So you can use custom domains and have your, your full statically driven website be hosted, well, quote unquote, for free by SourceHut. I mean, it's free because you don't really have to pay for the service now, but it comes as part of your user account. So uh, if you have a project where you want to have a website up or you want to do your personal blog, if it's all static pages, you can definitely do that using Source Hut's pages feature, which I think is uh, pretty awesome. Um, limitations. Let's take a look at this really quick. So um, they have a very interesting policy on what you can have on your site. Um, they actually they allow JavaScript on your own personal site. However, they don't allow you to embed things from external sites. So that means you cannot use files from CDNs. So for instance, if you want to use, let's say, the Bootstrap um, UI framework, you can't use that from a CDN, uh, which is pretty common for people. You basically like pull in the JavaScript from a an external link. No, on this, you actually have to have those files in your uh, statically built pages to be served from this website alone. I think this also means you cannot embed things uh, from YouTube, possibly even because that requires having uh, external website stuff referenced in. So um, it might require you to rethink what you might have on your website. Uh, but still, it's a great thing to have if you really want to have a good site that um, is uh, statically hosted, fast to load, doesn't have trackers built into it and uh, is, is fully yours. So I think it's a pretty awesome thing to, uh, uh, to to have available as a service. So I'm, I think I'm gonna try this out for the System Crapper site and see how it goes, maybe even for my own personal blog site and see how far I can get with it. Currently I'm hosting those things using GitHub pages, but um, I mean, it's easy to move those things since they're all just static files anyway. Uh, and I'm generating the current System Crapper site using uh, org mode, I think. I, I haven't really talked about it much because it's not complete yet, but systemcrafters.cc. So if you go there, there's just a static website, um, which is very, very simple. And uh, yeah, it doesn't really have anything there yet. So I need to I need to spend some time working on that, actually. Abdullah. I don't know. People are here. I guess they care. Let's see.
Uh, Garzola says you should do the System Crafter site with Org Publish. I think, uh, yeah, I think I'd do that. I'm not sure. Oh, I have a published script that I use for it. I don't know if it's uh, using Org Publish or just something myself, but. Let's see. Okay. So GraphQL based APIs. So that is uh, another thing here. If you like using APIs to interact with uh, features of a website, um, GraphQL is kind of interesting because it doesn't use the normal uh, REST based API framework that you would see on a lot of other websites, but it's kind of becoming more of a standard now with sites like GitHub and GitLab. I think they have GraphQL and other sites using GraphQL, which is basically a more structured form of requesting for information because it does allow you to do more advanced queries um, and operations that way. So if you want to look into uh, how to use their stuff through APIs, they have, uh, let's see, can I get back to that now? Anyway, on the meta page, there is, uh, sorry, on the man page, there's links for all the API references for these things. Some of these are REST based as we saw with uh, builds.sr.ht, but then others, I think like the project hub are um, GraphQL based. Oh, they don't have docs for that, interesting. So, um, that's something that could be useful to you if you care about APIs. Okay, let's talk about what it doesn't have. And someone mentioned this before. Um, let's see. Yeah, I can't see it now. But uh, basically, uh, what it doesn't have, it doesn't have starred repositories, or you can't star a repository. So the question is, how will I know that the thing that I'm making is cool if I can't see all the stars that uh, are on my repository? I mean, it, this is sort of controversial I think um, because it is kind of a useful metric to see whether people are caring about your project or find it interesting however I think that it's easy to get distracted by uh, the number of stars that you have or the wow did this thing freeze uh, the number of stars that you have or the, um, the the sort of perceived popularity of your project it, it can distract you from the actual work to be done on it because you're sort of w more worried about like getting more stars or whatever than uh, actually doing the necessary work. So I don't think it's a bad thing to not have stars. And uh, the, the other thing about stars is that they're really just a bookmarking mechanic on GitHub. So um, since we're talking about a site that is more about like decentralized protocols and using the native ways to do things, there's a thing that you can do in your browser called bookmarking that you can use to bookmark that website if you want to, to remember that repo. Uh, there's also, um, you know, storing that link to the repo in your org mode notes or even having it as a link on your website. So think of it this way. Instead of uh, starring a repo, maybe go write a blog post about a cool project you found and uh, link to the repo that way. And that's actually more valuable to someone than just, you know, clicking the star button on their repository and just giving them a plus one on their number that's going up. So uh, basically... I feel like uh, starred repos are not necessary for a good uh, collaboration site. And in fact, they might be uh, they might inhibit the right kind of behavior. So I think it's interesting that they, they've made this choice. Also, uh, pull, they don't have pull requests, or at least not explicitly. Um, and so how will people contribute? Well, Firelights just asked, uh, can I show the whole PR process in SourceHut? Yeah, I do want to make a video or on another stream basically showing what the email based contribution flow would look like so that people understand it. Um, so I feel like, uh, this is a better way to do things because you have more freedom and control over how you interact with the project. Um, now we did see that there was some kind of interface that did allow you to create patches at least. So I need to look at that a little bit more closely because there may actually be something for doing something like pull requests on the site. Um, however, you don't have to do it that way if you don't want to, which I think is great. Uh, also... JavaScript code. It doesn't have JavaScript code, or at least as far as I know, they've made it a very big point not to use JavaScript, uh, mainly because it lets you use the site in more interesting ways. Uh, if you are able to look at it in a terminal based browser or an Emacs, Emacs based browser, or just not have to worry that there's some arbitrary code running in your browser that might be tracking you or doing anything else that you wouldn't want it to do. So uh, not having JavaScript code probably makes it easier for us and also makes it easier for them too because they can focus on just writing a good backend software and using the normal things that people use for years, which is basically just like, you know, post requests from forms or, you know, a URL requests and stuff. Um, th there's really no point in having all the, the heavy JavaScript. I mean, it's not necessary for a good website. You don't have to have that. And also analytics trackers. I mean, 
Uh, a lot of people don't like being tracked around the internet. I, I don't really either, but I don't really think too much about it because I, I have other things I want to do with my brain power. But um, this is something that you won't have a problem with on this website, which I think is nice. Uh, and another thing that it doesn't have that is very sad to me is uh, org mode file rendering. So one thing that I really like doing is sending people links to my dot files repository on GitHub because it renders my dot my org mode based configuration files uh, as a normal document on GitHub. Um, but it doesn't have that on uh, on SourceFlat. However, I think you know maybe. What this is is an opportunity. Instead of complaining about the fact that it doesn't have org file rendering, I should just go and make my dot .files page an actual website and then style it however I want, display it however I want, and then I can send people links to that instead and not have to depend on some other website to do it for me. So I think what SourceHut kind of is doing is it's encouraging us to, to go back to some older ways of doing things that we sort of lost track of over time. Instead of having our own personal websites and you know making our own presence on the internet we've been giving our identity over to these centralized sites to do it for us and it kind of loses some of the magic of the internet that we used to have back in like the you know, the 90s and the early 2000s before we started using these big central social media sites where everybody had their own website they had their own sort of vibe on their site they had their own organization they talked about whatever they wanted to talk about I think it's kind of cool to start thinking about doing that again. So instead of me having my GitHub profile with all the stuff there on it, maybe I have my personal website again and just have my dot files there and then I can have it look however I want. So I kind of believe that maybe this is going to be better for me than worse in the end. Um, and then if you think about it, you can have your own website hosted through SourceHut, generate it through their SourceHut pages feature, and then you're sort of, you sort of still get the same benefits. You have some hosting that you don't necessarily have to pay for explicitly, and uh, you can have your site there uh, generated yourself however you like. So I don't know. I kind of feel like it's better. So uh, how it works, we won't cover this very much because we've spent a lot of time talking about it already. Uh, most of the functionality on the site is driven by two things, Git repositories or even Mercurial and uh, email lists, uh, which I think is great because what that means is you can use the inbuilt tools to, let's say, Emacs to manage the, uh, the emails that are coming in for the con uh, contributions and communication about projects. <clears throat> so like using MU4E. And then you can use uh, Magit for looking at those patches that people are sending you so that you have a much better native interface to look at those things in your tool that you're already using rather than having to go to a third-party website and then look at it there. So think about it this way. Um, instead of going and looking at your GitHub notifications page, you just open up MU4E. You have all your email notifications there. You can... Put them in different search queries so you'd only see certain types of emails at certain times. You can you know, set up capture links like we showed in the MU4E series so that you can capture those emails to your org mode to-do lists so that you have your to-do list for the things that you need to follow up on for the contributions to your project, the questions that people have. Uh, there's, there's so many things that you can do that get integrated into your actual Emacs workflow that you cannot do if you have to go to somebody's website to do that. So I feel like having all this email locally gives you the full power of Emacs to, to manage your workflow the right way. And then you can look at Git patches and apply them using the tools that are already better that we know are better than just going to a website. So I don't know. I think that, uh, this is much better for people like us who would prefer to use something like Emacs or other terminal based applications. <clears throat> and like I mentioned before, I'm eventually going to do a video showing that email driven contribution workflow so that you can get a sense of how it would work on the site and also how it would work in Emacs. Um, so you can see why it's better, basically. Okay, so lastly, let's just talk about why this matters. Um, it's important to try to improve on this email driven collaboration flow. If you remember the first stream I did in this new sort of formulation of streaming, where we talked about the future of Emacs. Um, I said that uh, it sort of puts Emacs at risk to have this email based workflow because everyone's used to GitHub these days. But the reality is that it's not that bad to do things based on email, but we really need a better interface or we need more modern tools for doing this kind of workflow. So if this, <clears throat> excuse me, if this website can get people used to the idea of uh, 
doing email-based workflow, get comfortable with it, then maybe people can get back to doing things in a more sort of native way rather than having these third-party websites. I think it's a very valiant, excuse me, I'm losing my voice again. I think it's a very valiant effort to uh, try to improve this because it is more in line with the free software ethos, the, the sort of principles of free software. If you read the blog posts on the website or the, the marketing information about SourceHut, you will see that they care very much about the free software ecosystem and, and basically supporting it through having these tools. So uh, if you want to see the future of what free software development looks like, this is probably the place where it's going to happen. So definitely keep an eye on SourceHut for that reason. Uh, also, it, it provides the most useful features of sites like GitHub or GitLab while still respecting user privacy and freedom. So, uh, you know, GitHub um, is proprietary and uh, it, it's a great tool. Like I, I enjoy using GitHub because it makes it easy to do contributions, but some people may not like GitHub because it's proprietary. So if you want something that is more about your freedom, then you should use SourceHut for that purpose. Uh, GitLab is more in the middle where it's written by a company, but it is free software and you can install it and use it yourself however you want. So uh, if you needed something that's more in the middle between GitHub and SourceHut, then GitLab is a good choice for that. Um, but I think GitLab still is a lot more heavyweight, it's very JavaScript based, etc. So, um, you know, it has less of this, the principles that Source Hut has. Um, and then, uh, lastly, it gives you the freedom to integrate the collaboration flow into your own tools, which I think is like the biggest selling point to me, where if I wanted to, I don't wouldn't have to go to their website to do any collaboration. I could do it all inside of Emacs and have more control over how I do my work and not be bothered by random email notifications or whatever from the website that I don't want or that I can't really interact with uh, effectively through uh, my own tools. So I think it's very important for that. I think everybody should give it a try. Uh, create an account there. Take a look at the repos that are around. Uh, consider paying for the service to support the people who are spending their time to make it because that's the only way that things like this are going to continue. Like I've said before, um, we're, if we care about doing things a different way than the mainstream or doing it the way that you know the, the companies want things to be done then we kind of have to put some skin in the game either through our own contributions to these projects or financial contributions through either paying for the services or like patreon or whatever so uh when cool things like this are around uh and you want to see them continue you definitely need to do something to help uh jean noel we're not going to talk about that <laughs> so i think that's it for the, the source hut topic. So uh, that's all that I had for the prepared topics for the day, but I'm interested in whatever you all have to talk about uh, with me today, like questions you may have about Emacs or any other things that you would find interesting to talk about. Let me see what else we have in the, uh, the comments here. Uh, Ander says, you can send a diff through mail. I believe you get, can produce a diff for mailing. Yeah, if you use... Um, was it Git AM or something like that? It formats a patch. You can also do that in um, in, in Magit. If you go to a repository, let's say if I go to my dot .files repository, uh, with the key bindings I have set up, I can use capital W to format patches. Then it gives up this little menu at the bottom and I can uh, hit C to create a patch. And then I can go through the other options to basically create a patch file. But you can also use very simple commands on the command line to create a, uh, a diff or a patch file for uh, the changes that you've made. Uh, let's see. Uh, Garjola says, maybe we can contribute the org rendering to uh, Source Hut. Yeah, it's very likely that you could. I don't really know how they feel about it, but um, I would definitely um, communicate with the people there and see if they would be open to that contribution because it would be very good to have that. Uh, Piotr says, it sounds like what Luke Smith is advocating for. Uh, yeah, I mean, Luke is also sort of on this trail, I think. Um, He's definitely advocating for people to have their own websites and not use all the centralized services. I, I kind of agree with it uh, from that perspective. Uh, Garjolo notes that Luke does not like Emacs. Uh, yeah, he had a snarky video about Emacs once, but I don't think that it's not necessarily that he doesn't like it. I think he just prefers the Unix way of doing things, having independent programs for all of it, which is fine. Um, let's see. Uh, Jean-Noël asks, how do you interact with GitHub from Emacs? There is the uh, Forge package, which is like a companion to Magit, which allows you to um, look at issues and pull requests from your GitHub repositories uh, using the same Magit interface. Uh, it's it's kind of cool, actually. 
what else we got here? Uh, some people have left GitHub and gone to get, go to get, GitLab. Yep, I know I saw that happening. Um, let's see. The problem with source HUD is that most people are lost with email and personal organization. We're just used to react to the latest and loudest, not to organize tasks, be efficient with email, etc. Um, yes, I agree. But that's sort of one of the things I'm trying to help do with this channel is to show people how to use these tools in a way that actually helps their workflow and gives them more control over it. Um, so that you can basically uh, be in control of your computing environment and also have more control over how you do your work so you can do it more efficiently and effectively. So I think that using email, uh, using MU4E and using org and all that stuff together is pretty powerful for, for doing this. Um, Felipe corrected me saying that get AM is apply mailbox, get format patches what you want. Yes, you're right about that. Thank you. Uh, AstroCat says, I have to learn uh, Magit more. I use Git from the shell. Yeah. Um, I used to use Git from the shell exclusively. And then whenever I, whenever I actually spent the time to learn to use Magit and started using it, I never went back to the shell because the shell is so slow by comparison. Just type it in commands. Even if you set up Git aliases, um, I feel like I'm a ninja when I use uh, Magit because of just the how fast I can press different key bindings to make certain things happen. I don't know. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's a great tool. Let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else interesting uh, going on this week. A lot, a lot of interesting discussions in the System Crafters Discord. <clears throat> if you're not a member of the Discord, definitely check the link below and uh, and see how to join that. Uh, a lot of new people joining. Uh, a lot of people asking about uh, GNU Geeks. So that's sort of why I want to talk about Geeks next week um, to give an overview, basically, of GNU Geeks and how all the different ways it can be used and um, why it's cool, basically. Uh, Firelight says, uh, Magit is also really fast to learn. Just type question mark. Yeah, basically, if you open Magit. Hold on. My key binding is failing me at the moment. Here we go. Let me just go to a, a repo. Dot files. Yeah, so if you press question mark, you get this panel at the bottom, which basically tells you all the, the prefix keys that you can press to get to other commands like fetch, pull, log, clone. Uh, changing branches, all kinds of stuff. Uh, once you memorize these, you can press them very quickly and get to a lot of different things. Like for instance, LL to get to the log of all the commits. Um, it's very useful to be able to, to do all this stuff uh, so easily. <clears throat> you can also do cherry picking of commits very easily. It was not very e easy to figure out how to do that the first time, but once you know it, then you you really understand how to, uh, to, to, to use it. Uh, oh yeah, Pewter, uh, thanks for reminding me. Uh, last week, um, DistroTube, uh, Derek Taylor from DistroTube put out a video talking about the channels that he's watching in 2021, and he did mention System Crafters there, which was very, very nice. I, uh, I'm very thankful to him for, for mentioning the channel in his, <clears throat> in his video. I think, um, we grew by about a thousand subscribers after that video. So I'm very thankful to him for, for giving some exposure to, uh, our small channel here, um. So uh, th thank you to, to Derek, and also uh, ha ha happy to see all of you people who might have come here from DistroTube. <clears throat> uh, Eric, uh, Eric Ole, I guess that's how you might pronounce that. Or, or Eric Ole, maybe? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a demo of cherry picking would be sweet. Can't get it to work. Um, hmm. Let's see, can I do that really quickly? Let me just see if I can try it. So I'm going to create a branch. So B, no, excuse me, BS for spinoff branch, uh, test dash branch. Okay, so now I'm on test branch. Uh, let's see. Let me go into, <coughs> excuse me. Let's go into a file. How did I change this one? Oh, yeah, I don't need that anymore. So I can just uh, commit this. So I'm going to commit this change I just made. Um, unneeded change. Control C, Control C to commit. <clears throat> and then um, what I'm going to do is create another branch off of master. So let me uh, go back to master really quickly. BB master. I'm going to go BS to create a new branch, branch like another test. All right. So now I don't have that commit that I just made um, in the other branch. But what I'm going to do is press uh, L and then O for other. Oh, no, that's not right. L and then was it capital L? 
<coughs> to get all the commits from all local branches. So this um, unneeded change is on a branch called test branch, which you can see right here. And then I'm on a branch right now called another test. But if I want to cherry pick this change from that branch, I can just select it and then press, I think it's uh, A for apply. And then it's already done, I think. If I go back to the status here, uh, it applied that change directly. I, but actually, I want, it, I want it to apply the commit. So I think it may be capital A. So let me discard that change. We'll go back to L, capital L, and then select this commit. Let me double check what I'm supposed to be pressing here. Capital A for apply. So capital A, and then I think it's capital A again to pick that commit. And now if I go to my status, now I see another test branch has the unneeded needed change and the recent commit should also reflect that. So basically list all the commits for all the branches to find the commit you want, select it and then press capital A, capital A, at least with the evil, sorry, with the evil collection bindings for Magit. And then it will pick that commit and put it into the current uh, branch that you're currently in. So it's pretty awesome. It's a great little, uh, great little workflow because it makes things a lot faster. Uh, Igor says there is a Forge PR introducing the ability to perform GitHub GitLab review using Magit, which is about to be merged. Uh, yeah, it'd be really nice to have that capability to, um, excuse me, uh, to, to do these things built into, uh, into Emacs. But I think you're always going to be losing functionality that you would have on the GitHub web interface. It would be better if you didn't have to lose functionality. And I think that's one of the things that Source Hub is, um, bring to the table felipe says you can just hit aa for magic status you don't need to go to the log view let's see uh i think i was trying to do that before in the past and it didn't work okay so it's, so this is what happens i hit Control a Control a it asks cherry pick i guess i can pick test branch but then it it tries to to pick it automatically it doesn't really let me choose which commits to pick so i kind of like to pick specific commits instead <clears throat> excuse me uh, so what I'm going to do now is press capital A and then lowercase a to abort the cherry pick in this case. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a series about Magit or Magit, Magit at some point to go into more detail about workflows using it because um, there's a lot of things you can do that are not really obvious uh, when you start using it. And it'd be great to show some of those things so that you can uh, put them into your own workflow. We've reached a point in the stream where my throat is not going to cooperate anymore. <clears throat> so any other uh, thoughts or questions today? What else is interesting? Um, so Piotr also mentioned that <clears throat> Sasha Chua has uh, been mentioning my videos in her Emacs news post. Yeah, that's been going on for a while now. Sasha is very great about uh, gathering up all the things happening in the uh, Emacs space every week. <clears throat> which is a, a big job, if you ask me. Let's actually take a look at what else is going on. <coughs> it's actually a great way to, to find out about um, things that are being done in Emacs development. So some things about speeding up JSON.EL encoding. Um, let's see. There's also some new require theme function. I wonder why that's added. Load a theme or library stored in the custom theme load path. Um, work substitute for require in a case where it cannot be used. Interesting. I don't know why that was necessary, but. <clears throat> yeah, Felipe, I've, I've, I've never seen it give me a list of commits. It always gives me the list of branches to pick from first. It's always been my, my experience. It could just be the way that my bindings are set up, though. I don't know. Help key binding, interesting. Okay, so there's new faces for, for coloring key bindings in help descriptions, which is cool. Oh, there's this thing, uh, evil motion training. I haven't used this yet, uh, but it, it sounds really great. So it's a package for Emacs. Let's see. Evil motion trainer. Anyway, it doesn't really give an ex a description of how to install it here. However, basically, it's a package that can help you to uh, burn in those evil motion keys into your uh, into your muscle memory so that you can use them more consistently. Um, and it will yell at you whenever you start using arrow keys or you start using like HJKL too repeatedly to like move down lines. It will basically try to get you to use other navigation features of the Vim uh, modal editing style 
for movement. So uh, it's something that I want to set up soon because I really do want to get more acclimated to using all of the modal movements uh, in the evil mode, basically. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to do that whenever you don't have something forcing you to. So this is a package that will force you to do that. Apparently, it's called uh, Evil Motion Trainer on GitHub. Uh, I'll drop that into the uh, chat here. Evan, yes, uh, the, the recording will be available after the fact. I think chat also will be available as part of the recording. So, uh, yeah, let's see what else is kind of happening in the world right now. So, oh, wow, I went back too far. Uh, I recognize this, reading, writing, reading and writing buffers in practice. Let's see. Org is a book publisher. That's cool. What about that? So someone is using it for publishing a book. That's great. Anyway, lots of cool stuff on the Emacs news post that uh, Satya posts every week. If you want to have a really good way to keep up with um, all of that, then I would say add her to your RSS feed reader so that you can kind of keep up to date. I, is there an RSS link here? No, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure there's RSS for this, this site. Another interesting post about doing RSS with uh, Org Static Blog. I haven't really used Org Static Blog, but I found, I felt like it wasn't necessary for the things I needed to do. Anyway. All right. <laughs> Garjola says, uh, uh, looking forward to see the next video about doing your taxes in org tables with Emacs Calc. Well, uh, I did use org tables to do some calculations for taxes maybe two months ago. So it, you're, you're not far off from the truth. I did use org for, uh, for doing some tax calculations. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the easiest thing to do, though. <clears throat> so I would not necessarily uh, recommend it, but uh, it's doable. DP says, can't find information on how to use letters with dashes in Magit and Doom Emacs. Uh, letters with, oh, you mean like <clears throat> different character sets? I don't really know about that. If anybody else knows, definitely pass a link along to uh, to DP. Um, and then Lord Debbie says, why did you go for EXWM over StumpWM? Because EXWM is integrated with Emacs. <coughs> Excuse me. Stump. Um, I've tried it a couple times. It's always been kind of weird to me. I don't really understand the usage, usage model as well as I do EXWM. And um, uh, Anders is asking, what is StumpWM? It's basically a common lisp written, or it's, it's a window manager written in common lisp. And you can connect to it with uh, slime, etc. to be able to control it interactively. <clears throat> but it's, um, it's a tiling window manager, manual tiling window manager, I think. And uh, it's, I don't know, like, I feel like it's a great idea, but it was never stable or that useful to me. EXWM was immediately useful to me, and it, all, it allowed me to really easily tie together everything I was doing with, uh, with Emacs and with my computer. So uh, I, even though EXWM isn't perfect, I felt like it was a better choice. Yeah, Common List has a, a massive library collection. I mean, it's great for writing programs and stuff, but... Uh, Emacs is really good for your own personal workflow and desktop environment, in my opinion. So things are slowing down a little bit now in the stream. I feel like, you know, we covered all the topics we want to talk about today. So I probably won't take up much more of your time here. But um, yeah, I think that that that's probably it for this time. So hopefully that uh, discussion of these topics today was useful to you. Uh, next week, I'll probably do more of a emacs focused uh stream again uh, maybe some some programming emacs lisp at the second half uh as always we'll be doing some kind of discussion in the first half because i enjoy doing those i think it's kind of kind of interesting to talk about certain topics that i wouldn't normally make videos on and uh then yeah like i mentioned on monday i'm pretty sure that i'm going to do uh, an introductory video to GNU geeks to basically talk about the use cases for it uh we're not going to go into detail of how to use it yet but i'm going to do more videos to to show the different ways to use it after we've done sort of the high level uh, introduction to it so uh before we go let me just say thank you to all of my uh, my sponsors and patrons 
uh, all of these people uh, have decided to sponsor the work that I'm doing, making these videos and uh, you know running the, the System Crafters community. And I'm very thankful to them for, for their support. Uh, it means a lot and it really helps keep me going whenever things get difficult and you know it's hard to make a video for a particular week. Uh, I just keep in mind my sponsors and the fact that I don't want to let them down. So if you are uh, interested in, in sponsoring the work that I'm doing here, definitely check out the two links that I have below in the description. One is for GitHub sponsors and then the other is for Patreon. I also have a link for one-time donations on uh, PayPal. I'm also considering using some alternative sites like Libra Pay in the future. So if you would like to uh, contribute to the channel, uh, but you don't like any of the other options, definitely let me know if there's a, an option that would be better for you, like Libra Pay or something else. And I'm, I'm really interested in trying to set something else up because I want people to have uh, options for doing that, that, that fit with whatever they want to do. Uh, so yeah, like I said, we're going to be forging ahead with more videos and, and streams next week. And uh, I, I uh, lastly just want to say I appreciate all of you who showed up today. Thank you so much for, for contributing to the conversation and for just being awesome people for hanging out with me on this, on this nice uh, sunny Friday. And uh, until next time, thanks a lot for watching and happy hacking. See ya.